you know, so I don't know. What was your question again? My question was, <laughs> my question was, you said that you wished you had gotten to your your, your relationship with the media. Oh yeah. Um, has gotten better, and you wished you would have had a little taste of that yeah. before you started your career as a player. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, you have to know what your, your strengths and your weaknesses are, and you know, after my suspension, especially, uh, you know, I came from Seattle. We had two two writers. One was Bob Finnegan for the New York Times, one was uh, Jim Street for the Post, Post Intelligence. And these guys, we had a 25 men roster. It felt like there were 26 and 27 men in our roster because those were the days, Willow, that you know, reporters would come after the game, they would interview you, then you see them in the hotel bar and you go have beers with them and you talk about the game and everything was off the record. And it was this incredible kind of, um, you know, kind of boys club uh, uh, that, that there was a lot of trust. Obviously that changed over the years. Uh, and then I went to Texas, and instead of two, we had six. And then obviously you go to New York, and the whole world opens up, and there's you know 50 or 70 or li literally postseason, we can have over 120 uh, you know men and women there that are covering the team. Um, I, I think the thing that shifted things for me was that I I realized I was really good at baseball, and I was really bad at handling the media, and the contrast of that was kind of where I lived, and I realized that I needed to spend real time dealing with people and not being scared of the media. Forever, I saw a reporter and I would run the other way. And what I learned was that lean into that reporter, get to know that reporter and realize that they're not bad people, they have a job to do, but if you treat them with respect and you work on your communicating skills, then it can be a win-win for everybody. You know, it's interesting, I've seen CEOs do that really effectively too and, and work on, on um, the two-way nature of the communications and ask the questions like, how could I help communicate that story to you a little bit better? And it's, and it's really a, an effective strategy. You are being modest, however. One of the interesting things is, I, and I was telling Alex earlier, um, it's rare when a player makes a transition like the one you have made um, that they get the kind of reaction um, from, from the media that you have gotten. I mean, what they are saying about your work is really, really impressive. And I just want to share a little bit of that with you. Um, one reporter said, throughout the MLB postseason, we've seen A-Rod transform before our eyes. As one-fourth of the MLB on Fox pre- and post-game studio show, he's been showing the baseball world a new side. He's smart, he's insightful, he pokes fun at himself, and perhaps most amazingly, he doesn't come off like a guy who was the most controversial player in MLB for a decade. He's, dare we say it, likable. <laughs> Is that a fair assessment? Was that the USC Journal? <laughs> that was nice. Did you make that up? <laughs> I never read that. <laughs> Wait, another one said his long hidden humanity has been on display every night. I mean, that's a remarkable thing for people to say about you, particularly early in your career as a broadcaster, because it is so often the case, and you all know this from your, from your work on air in the studio, it, it takes a while to be comfortable in your own skin on television and to develop that relationship with an audience. So how were you able to do that so quickly? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, we had an incredible team, both on air and our producers and directors behind the scenes. Um, they created an environment that was very friendly, and, and from day one I felt very comfortable, uh, starting with Kevin Burkhardt, which was our quarterback, and in many ways he was like Magic Johnson. He just tried to make us look really good every night and kind of tee us up with, with just some great leads. But I, I never thought about being in television, but what I did focus on was a subject matter. And, you know, my 10,000 hours came in learning baseball, the intricacies of baseball, studying, you know, body language, body movement, pitcher movement, um, and all the little things about the game that I love so much. And I think when you dominate a language or when you dominate a subject matter, then whether you're Warren Buffett trying to explain the S&P 500 and what's happening, it always sounds like Warren to me is he never loses you and I try to you know take something that I understand really really well well at the core and convey it in a matter that's simple and digestible so you mentioned preparing a lot um, you know all of that right from your history what do you do to get ready to go on air yeah I mean I found myself making tons of phone calls ah. because to me the information comes from the sources that are next to the player. 
right? If somebody is struggling, I want to talk to their hitting coach, or I want to talk to the bat boy, or I want to talk to the kid that's literally, you know, cleaning uh, their jocks every day. Because you get information from those kids a lot more than you will from any GM or some fancy president. Because they're going to tell you the truth. And, you know, some of the questions I ask is, tell me about his attitude when he hits a home run versus when he strikes out four times. Tell me about how he is when he does well and the team loses. Tell me how he is when he does poorly and the team wins. And, you know, with my experience, I ask you enough questions, I'm going to be able to corner you, and then I can start kind of creating the narrative of what I want to convey to the audience. I bet the guy washing the towel, shall we say, is a little <laughs> surprised when there's Alex Rodriguez on the phone. Why do you make too many calls? But <laughs> <laughs> to those them, to those towel boys. Um, that, but that is but that is one um, one way where your access uh, and and the recognition that you bring to the job helps you unearth sources and and reach out to sources. Um, what would your advice be to a student who doesn't have the name recognition that that you have at unearthing those sources? Well, I think it starts with um, trust and, and building some credibility. And if the first time you show up to kind of my locker is when I've done something really dumb, which in my case, it was very often, um, immediately I'm going to be kind of alienated from it. Um, <laughs> the kid liked a dumb comment. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the things I would say to you is that, you know, come to us when you don't really need us. Come to us when you're saying, hey, I'm writing a story about your fellow mate, the second baseman, and, you know, here's how I see it. If I write this, would I sound like silly or would I be on point? Um, and if not, can you kind of get me on the right track? Because I want to really do a, a fair article for this young man. And then you may say a few things to him and, or her and say, this is off the record. And for me, I'm testing you. And for you, you're testing me and see you know, where we're at. And you do that four or five times. All of a sudden, something kind of hairy comes up. And you come up, and you have a little bit of my trust. And I will say this, that this, this career, for us, especially in a place like New York, that there's so many... Um, uh, potential pitfalls is you're looking for someone you trust, someone that if you say is off the record, it is going to be off the record, someone that is not going to ambush you, someone that if they have a story coming, they're going to send you a, a short email and say, hey, I'm thinking about writing this for tomorrow's paper. You know, I have to 7 o'clock. Can you give me a call? And, and, and not be over dramatic, but just kind of stick to the facts. And I think over time, that would pay tremendous dividends in your career. One of the things that you and I talked about bef before you joined us was your journey and how you believe that you were a different person before your suspension, during your year off, and after. And I wonder if you could share a little bit of that journey with us. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people don't know this. So I, I went to high school in uh, Miami. I was a quarterback and I was a shortstop. And forever my dream was to be uh, a shortstop at the University of Miami and you know, we didn't have the Yankees or the Marlins. When I grew up, we just had the University of Miami. And I've always been obsessed with colleges, and I've always been obsessed with education. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I served uh, my suspension in 2014, I went to business school at the University of Miami, and I went to school at the University of Columbia in, in, in New York. And that was the one part of the suspension that I actually enjoyed. Um, <laughs> I keep losing my train of thought. Willa, help me out here. So um, I, well, I, well, is there anything else you enjoyed about that year off? You were, you were telling yeah. your story. You were telling your story about you, you um, were attracted to school, right? Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. didn't go to school. You wound up going into the majors. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So because we had that conversation, I'm trying to kind of think about what is it that you wanted to talk about. So the, the idea of before and after the suspension and how different I was, and I shared this with Will in a conversation uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. And the idea is... I went from that high school to prom, and a few months later, I debuted in the big leagues as an 18-year-old boy. And I say boy because that's what I was. I remember one of my teammates was 44 years old. His name was Goose Gossage. And I remember that after the game, we would get on the bus, and everybody was calling their wives and their kids, and I'm calling my mother because that's who I live with when I go back home. And, you know, those calls, I started making them in the bathroom. I would lock up. i go, Mom, I went 0 for 3 with an error. Um, <laughs> I'll call you when I get to the hotel. And I would hang up. And it was quite embarrassing. And oh. so there was a big gap for me. But all along, like, you know, a Navy SEAL or someone who's really focused or like a doctor or someone that just had this kind of myopic, singular focus, laser focus to do one thing really well, 
was I thought my job was to go out and hit home runs and hit RBIs and win games, and that was ultimately the only barometer that I had to live up to. And what happened was, while I served my suspension, I had an opportunity with a full year to press the pause button and have a better understanding of how did I want to come out on the other side of this. Uh, I wasn't sure what the baseball side was going to come out because ultimately I couldn't control that. But I could control how grateful and appreciation that I had towards you know, management, towards the commissioner's office, towards the clubhouse that I missed so much while I was gone, and to the fans of you know, not only Yankees, but fans all over baseball. And what I found, including the media, is that, man, I really, really enjoyed this side of life. I really enjoyed the ups and the downs. And at the end of the day, I was one of 750 as a 40-year-old that got to wear a Yankee uniform and hit third. And I think because of that attitude and the appreciation, I was able to go out and hit 33 home runs and uh, lead us to the playoffs that year. And what was that? So you left the game angry. Mm -hmm. Right, fair to say, and you returned, what, grateful? Yeah, I, that, that's pretty pretty accurate. Well, I, I left angry, I left upset. I I hired a bunch of attorneys and publicists and and guys, and uh, I sued everyone, and I made a m bunch of mistakes, and then I doubled down and made them worse. <laughs> and everyone's like, "Well, you got some bad advice," and I said, "You know, that's BS. I made those decisions, and I was the quarterback, and I hired them." And ultimately, every decision that was made, I had to approve on it, and I did. And ultimately, I realized that uh, I was not only destroying my life, but I was not only was I you know, destroying my baseball career, but I was destroying my life. And I'm a father of two beautiful girls. Uh, I'm a son of, of, of a great lady who was a mentor of mine and still is. And I realized that I need to, needed to fix my life now and now, now, now. And today, you carry that with you? I do, you know, and, and one of the things I think about is, you know, having Natasha and Ella who are, you know, 12 and 8, and, and by the way, let me just spend two minutes on my daughters because <laughs> it is my favorite subject. You know, Natasha, uh, they say she looks like me and she's a lot like me, so she's A personality, type A, and uh, she's already planned her, you know, next 50 years. She's already decided she goes to Ransom Everglades, which is like our little Yale, Harvard, in Miami, a uh, little private school. She's in sixth grade. She's going to Princeton for undergrad. Like, she's going to Harvard for uh, <laughs> graduate school, and then she's getting her PhD at Harvard. Uh, I'm sorry, at Stanford. Um, Ella, on the other <laughs> hand, is completely different. She can care less where she goes to college. Uh, she wants to go to school uh, with, with her mother went, which was Ohio State. And what she really wants to do is I have a company called A-Rod Corp, and she comes over every day and literally gets a paper and blocks the A and puts E-Rod for Ella, E-Rod <laughs> Corp. And she can't wait to take over as the next CEO. And she said, Dad, I'm going to make two big changes the minute I take over. Number one, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> and number two, I'm going to paint this whole office instead of white. It's going to be hot pink. <laughs> so she, she knows where she's going. So you have your priorities in order, Yeah, clearly. So you have a role right now with the Yankees uh, advising their prospects. How did that come about, and what do you, what do, you do with them? You know, so how, uh, when I... When we agreed to kind of end my career last year, uh, Hal was very generous to give me some great options. And one of them was, you can stay on as my advisor and report to me, uh, but what I really want you to do is really mentor our young players, which to me, Will, is the ultimate compliment uh, you can give to anyone, is that you're going to go and surround yourself with your kids or with the young prospects, kind of the jewel of, uh, of our organization in New York. Uh, and I took to that because it's something that I've done for, for, you know, for over 20 years. I've really enjoyed... Uh, mentorship and, and teaching uh, some of the baseball tricks between the lines of you know how to get things done and um, I just spent time in instructional league a few months ago I just came back last week from spring training I'm coming back to spring training in the next few weeks and you know I took a, a group of guys out uh, about 10 of them we went to Ruth Chris to have a nice steak dinner and we had you know a couple young players a couple guys from AAA and a couple guys from from the big leagues and you know all of them wanted to talk about um, you know, the highlights, you know, they go to my career highlights, they go to the 2009 World Series, they go to the RBIs, the home runs, whatever nonsense. And what I wanted to talk about, which, you know, Willow didn't even mention, I'm fifth all time. Did you guys know that? I'm fifth all time in strikeouts. Right? So that means that four people in the entire world have struck out more than me. So I have a PhD in failure, basically. But what it taught me was 
is that you can get knocked down to the canvas and you can get back up. And there's some days that you don't want to get back up because you don't think you can do it. And it's dark and it's, you know, you have pessimistic feelings all around you. But what I've learned is if you get up and put one foot in front of the other and you have belief, uh, you can accomplish some amazing, amazing things. So what advice do you, that's great advice, right? Fail, fail often and see where it gets you, right? Um, but as young people starting their careers, what, it, what do you find yourself sharing with them about the world? And what are you telling them, frankly, about their relationships with the media? Well, I think, number one, you have to surround yourself with really smart people that have a moral compass and are mentors to you, right? And that complement your set of skills. Um, I talk a lot to business schools, and I tell them, you know, athletes, there's this statistic where they're, you know, 70% of athletes are either bankrupt and divorced within two years of retirement. And if you think about kind of the tools, the assets that athletes have, they're great workers, they're routines, they know how to follow a bl blueprint, um, they're tough, they're relentless. So if you, if you mix that with a really, really smart business person and you merge them together, you have bis basically a business right there day one. And, and I would say the same thing to you guys, or I would say that to a young athlete, to surround yourself with, with, with smart people, with ask a lot of you know, right questions, and go out and be bold. I mean, a lot of people don't want to write that email. You'd be surprised how many emails we get. Leslie gets you know, hundreds of emails, and you know, she'll send me a bunch of them, and we get back to people. Uh, go ahead and send that email. You know, some great things have happened just by being bold and being creative, but uh, dream big and, and go for it. I think our students know how to send the email just based on what my inbox looks like these <laughs> days. Did you, so I know you said you studied um, at Columbia and Miami. Did you get, how, are you going to try to go finish your degree? No. How far along are you in that so, process? So actually now I'm taking classes uh, online uh, from Stanford Business School. And my goal is never to have the degree, although the degree would be really nice. It's really about the process. I mean, that's kind of how I built my career has been the process and not really focus about uh, the finances, although I've done really well financially, or not worry about the accolades, and I have a few accolades. I always worried about what do I have to do from 6 in the morning to the time I go to bed every day, and if I do that, uh, I'll take my chances. So uh, I wouldn't say, well, the, the goal is to um, get that degree, although that would be nice. It's just to continue to educate myself. Um, we're, we're open for business should you want to come take some <laughs> classes here, right? <laughs> is there a business school here? There's business school All here, right. but you know you might, for example, want to get a graduate degree in journalism, <laughs> or maybe even a master's in strategic communications, and some of the things that we have here. I can have a PhD in crisis management. There you go. <laughs> we got that. We teach that here. That's so, the class I need to be talking to. So I'm going to get some advice from <laughs> from you right now because one of the things that that we are doing, and I'm, I'm not sure even if the students know this, is that we are expanding the our curriculum in sports media. So when you think about sort of even, just, even from the lens of um, an athlete transitioning into media, what are some of the most important things you think we need to be teaching students about the sports media, not just journalism, but about the sports media industry? Well, I think one of the, the things we have to be careful for, and I, and, I, and I worry about my girls with this, with, you know, social media. You know, when I walked into the clubhouse uh, in 1994 for the first time, you know, nobody had a cell phone. And everybody was looking up and engaging and talking with everyone. And I felt that there was a great community about that. And that happened before the game, during the game, after the game. And then in the bar after the game, you have 14 or 15 guys talking about why we won the game and why we lost the game. Today, you walk into a clubhouse 20 minutes before the game, and literally you have 24 guys looking down at their iPad and Instagram and whatever nonsense they're looking at. And I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem because communicating skills is the greatest, for me, the greatest investment that you can have. To be able to tell your story clearly crystal clear as a leader, as a CEO, as a journalist. You ha life is about storytelling. And if you don't tell your story, nobody will do for you as you'll do for yourself. So what I would say is, you know, how do you differentiate yourself when you walk into a clubhouse in the New York Yankees and you have Derek Jeter on one side and A-Rod on another and Mariano Rivera and Andy Pettit. And, and maybe it's by the way you present yourself. Maybe it's by the way you dress. Maybe it's by you, the way you approach someone. Uh, and there's a kind of a, a cadence to uh, yourself that you can develop that will basically start building your brand. 
And what happens is when you're a gentleman or what's, uh, or if you're a respectful lady, <laughs> um, if Willow and I are teammates, and what's your name? Terrence. Terrence? I said, you know, Willow, and we're having lunch now, and, and I just did maybe a 20-minute, you know, sit down with you. I said, this guy, Terrence, he's, he's a really nice guy. He's a gentleman, you know. Let, let's watch what he writes tomorrow, but I think it went well. So, you know, Willow, you should keep an eye on him. He, he, I like him. Oh, wow, you do, Alex? Okay. So now here comes Terrence in three or four days, and you go talk to Willow, and all of a sudden, you're going to see her look at you square. She's going to square your shoulders to you. She's going to look at you in the eye, and now you have a fair shot to now work with one of my colleagues. So these are the kind of things that we talk about, so just think about that as well. Interesting. Um, I think this is a perfect time to turn to our um, student journalists in the front right. row. And I think, Connor, I might start with you, because I know you had a question about uh, media responsibilities in covering sports. Wanna go ahead and ask. And you can introduce yourself to the room, too. I'm Connor McGlynn. Um, yeah, so you talked about how your perspective changed going through being a player and all the highs and lows of your career and everything like that between player and media kind of relationship. But what have you learned about the responsibility of a sports journalist in today's world dealing with athletes and coming from the journalist perspective now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's changed, right? I mean, I remember the days that someone had a story, uh, Sports Illustrated would have a story, and you had, like, literally you had, like, 72 hours until it went to print because they came out on Wednesday or Thursday. I mean, obviously, those days are long gone. But I think in a world uh, of this rat race world that we're in today, again, it's about brand building. And I would just encourage all of you, Connor, to really think long, long term because you're going to be around for a really long time. And you may get a great story on a Monday in you know, 2017, but that better be a good story because that's going to be the last one for a while. And I don't think sometimes people think like that. And, and it's tough because it is competitive, and everybody wants that quote. And you know, every time you sat down with me for 20 minutes, you had a chance to do something really special because, A, I was a big player, but, B, I said a lot of stupid things. So um, you have to say, okay, you keep saying them things, I'm going to write them, right? But I, I think really think about in a world where everybody's racing to Twitter and everybody's trying to crack a story, if you really think about the facts and substance and educating yourself and really talk to smart people, then I always say, when I listen to someone on TV, and I think this is what makes Charles Barkley so great. Number one, he's raw, he's honest, he's real, he's funny as hell. But it's about your misses. When I hear somebody on television and their biggest miss is within 10%, I think that person is really credible. But if I turn on the TV on Monday and you're 10% one day, you're dead on the next day, and you know, two-thirds of the time you're missing by 80%, you've lost me at hello, and I've got to move to somebody else. So stay to the facts, be disciplined, and be a, per a person of character. I think it'll go a long ways for you. And when it's time for me or for Willow to do a big story, hey, Connor, you know what? Why don't you come to the office, and all of a sudden you have your story. But you've built that over years of credibility. And we're paying attention. Don't think we're not. By the way, Charles Barkley's daughter is getting her master's in journalism. Oh, really? At Columbia. He's, very, he's quite proud of that, which is pretty cute. So have you ever been wrong on the air? And have you ever had to? And then what do you do? You know, in live television, I'm wrong all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm wrong on air and off air, both. <laughs> um, you know, when you do live television and you're doing postseason baseball, you're doing the World Series, I mean, we had 42 million people watch us in Game 7. That was pretty scary. And, and it was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, series for baseball. And, uh, you know, if, if you're wrong, it, there's nothing wrong with coming back and saying, you know, yesterday I mentioned that, you know, Hendricks had 14 home runs. It was actually 16. And one more interesting thing, he's only struck out once in the last eight games, which, by the way, is phenomenal, right? And you can correct it, and there's a bank shot to that. And, and I think the audience at home has credibility. And then, the, remember, your audience is you have 25 players listening, coaches and managers, to everything you're saying. So your audience is really wide. And I think sometimes people get really singular and, again, myopic and say, I want to talk to my editor. I want to talk to the fans. You've got to talk to everyone because everyone is part of your business. Kristen, do you want to get up and introduce yourself? 
Do you want to stand or should I sit? Stand or sit. Up All right, I'll sit. My name is Kristen Lago. Um, so my question, we've kind of touched on throughout the conversation a little bit about your career, but I know what I'm kind of interested in is you're one of the baseball players of our generation that was really in the spotlight, both on the field and off the field with every move you made kind of being analyzed. So I'm curious, what was it like for you throughout your career having to balance as one person sort of three different personas, one as an athlete, one as a celebrity, and then one as a businessman or in your personal life? What was that like for you? Yeah, Kristen, thank you. Great question. Uh, so, so number one, it all changed in New York. So you go from two reporters to six to, you know, unlimited. And what I found is that the things that I thought were clever, cute, and funny in Seattle were stupid <laughs> and silly in New York. So that was an incredible shift, like literally over one, and that whacked me over the head. And, you know, I have this thing in my head that when I try to be clever and I try to be smooth and when I try to, you, you sound like you're full of crap. And people have their radars are on all the time. And people are like, I know people like you. You're not going to BS me. And you piss people off. And when I came back from suspension, I'm like, I'm silly. I'm dumb. I'm fifth in strikeouts. I've had some good. I've had, you know, and, and people are like, oh, my God, who is that guy? I actually like him. And, and I think that's what Fox did to me because I think ultimately you, you, it's obvious that I love the game of baseball. It's obvious that I have my 10,000 hours and I've studied it to, to no end. That's an incredible bond with people because people do love baseball. Baseball is America's game, no matter what the <laughs> other stats say. And I think someday we'll come back to number one because we do have an opening, but that's a sep separate subject. <laughs> um, and and I, I think when you do that, Willow, I think you have, uh, look, you did your show for eight years, so I didn't need to read anything about you. I trusted my eyes. And I know you were likable. I know Maud Rashad was likable. I know you were smart, and I knew it was a great show. And I think when you're on television, you disarm the writers. Because, Terrence, if you're watching me, you're going to decide, I like this guy, I don't like this guy, he's full of crap. So the writer doesn't have as much power. But if you never see me, and I never make myself available, and I never tell my story, and by the way, you got to tell people what's the truth, because they don't know. They're too damn busy in their own lives. So if you like me, that's it. There's no broker in the middle. We don't need a broker or a real estate agent. You and me as a television, that's a, that's a very powerful medium. So tell your story, and, and be aggressive. Play offense. And I think your, your point about the amount of preparation that you do really builds trust in people. I mean, just when somebody comes to you and they know that you have really worked hard to understand and get prepared to do this story, it puts people at ease um, in, in a pretty powerful way. Can I share a story? from? Yeah. Uh, so last year we covered the Kansas City Royals and the New York Mets. And uh, <laughs> Kansas City, okay, in the house. <laughs> Oh, Mets, okay. <laughs> well, they lost, so. <laughs> um, but, so, okay. So, I'm at a restaurant in, in, in the West Village, and the World Series had just ended two days ago. And, again, you got to understand, I've never done television. Every time you saw me on television, it was usually for something bad. So, this was a little different. World Series, things went w well. Uh, the Mets were in it, so, you know, we had fans watching from all over New York. And I remember being in a restaurant, and this is like the first experience of television. So I get up to go to the bathroom, and I feel like nine people get up at the same time in the restaurant. And you kind of feel when people are following you. So now I'm walking to the restroom. It's a long journey, kind of long walk. And I see like, I hear these guys. And there was like seven guys and like two, two, two ladies. And they were all like under the age of 23. And... They all came to the bathroom, and they're like, hey, we want to get your autograph. And I said, whoa, whoa, not in the bathroom. Let's just walk outside. And <laughs> so, and they wanted to take pictures and all that. And, and then they said, I'm like, wow, they really must be fans of my baseball game. And not one of them mentioned anything about my baseball career and the home runs that Willow said. They all wanted to talk about and reflect on what I did in the World Series, what I said about Matt Harvey, what I said about Murphy. And it was this, like, really powerful thing that I'm like, wait a minute. I just played for 23 years in the big leagues. And all you want to talk about is what I think about Matt Harvey and that point that I made. And, and, and does this guy really squat 500 pounds? And does that really help the revolution on his slider? And why is that? And I was like, holy smokes, this is really powerful. And they were all business schools. Actually, I think they went to Columbia. And that was the first time that I said, there is something here. Because when you teach someone and you start building trust, you know, for me, television was very um, uh, kind of repetitive, habitual. And when you start going to television, someone you trust, people start going to you for, for the truth. 
And that, by the way, that's not in sports media. It is hard to trust people in television. So when you do find someone that you really like and respect, you stick to them. Katie? Um, hi, my name is Katie Christie. Um, my question is more directed towards baseball, not necessarily business, but with your experience, with so many high school players in the draft, especially this year, what would you recommend to them, at, like considering when they're choosing to sign between a pro team or an NLI with the college or university? I mean, that is a great question. Um, and the reason why it's a great question, because it's not the same for everyone, right? So if my father um, had the fortune to be financially kind of fit, uh, I would have probably ended up going to the University of Miami. Um, but my mother worked two jobs. She was a secretary in the morning and served tables at night. And we rented a house. We didn't own our house. And my goal was to have my mother retire. And when that offer came in 1994, and someone offered me almost $1.5 million, that was more money than I ever dreamed of. So I really didn't have a choice. Um, if it was my son, it doesn't matter what they offer him, he's going to college. <laughs> because for me, um, Number one, I was starving to be in a university. I was starving to be on a campus. This is what I dreamt all along. And I took my SAT classes, and I knew that in order to go from Miami, I lived in a neighborhood called Kendall. I said, what an incredible country. You get to rent an apartment for $500, and I always figure out what is the formula. And then I go get a plan and go find the formula and go, go get my goals. And for me, it was like, how do you go from Kendall in Miami to Palo Alto? and go to Stanford. And what I found in my research was if, if you're a pretty good baseball player, you need, back then it was 1,000 in the SAT. I know the, the, the score system changed. You needed a 3.0, and you needed to be pretty good at baseball. So I had the last one covered. So then, <laughs> <laughs> so then I said I need some classes with SAT. So every Tuesday and Thursdays, starting my freshman year, I started going to SAT classes to basically have that option to go to Stanford. And in that process, I ended up signing with the University of Miami, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's, I think college is, is incredibly important. And if you have a choice, uh, I would definitely recommend all players to go to um, college. Terrence? I'm Terrence, as we've met. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your playing career, actually. So we're going to go back to July 8th, 1994. Your first game, can you kind of describe for the audience your experience, your emotions stepping to the plate for the first time, and how that compared to your last game as a Yankee? Wow, great question. You know, um, See, I told you. I told you the students' yeah. questions are way better than mine. <laughs> Good students. Um, so if you think about it, did anyone here go to high school prom? Come on, you can admit it. Willow, Willow you went. Well, I, I wish I would have gone. I didn't have a date. But truth is, I had an all-star game uh, during uh, our prom. And just a few months later, I'm debuting at Fenway Park as an 18-year-old. And I'm telling you, when you're someone who should not be in the big leagues, it was me. I was 18, and uh, I had the body of a man, but I had, obviously, the mind and the, and the, and, uh, of a child, right? And... Uh, I remember going there my first day, and obviously everyone flew in from Miami, my mother, my siblings, uh, some friends, and I was so nervous. I think game two or three, I faced Roger Clemens. <laughs> and for some of you that have never been to Fenway Park or have never hit at Fenway Park, um, I don't think anyone has had any at-bats here at Fenway Park. <laughs> so, I guess you have to believe me. Um, you, you can't see the ball in day, teams, day games very well. <sighs> and it's really bright, and the backdrop, which we call it the black, where you see where the ball comes out of. Uh, there's fans, and they're usually wearing white shirts, and there's movement, and it's actually really scary. And then they've changed that since. Um, and Roger Clemens was pitching, and I was like, oh, man, this is not going to be good. Please just put the ball in play. Don't embarrass yourself. And literally my knees were shaking. Um, so that, that was, that was uh, exciting to be there, but I, I, that's where I wanted to be a freshman in college, not face, facing <laughs> Roger Clemens. And then the other thing that... Oh, wait, so what happened? Uh, well, I got my first hit in game, game two. I think it was a, a little infield hit was, was my first hit. Okay. But the reason why I think that question is pertinent to me, and one of the things I'm most proud of is, you know, the arc of my career. I probably had my best year as a 19, 20-year-old, where I was second in MVP, and I won the batting title. 
and when I was a 40 year old. And I think that story and that arc told me a lot of things that I needed to know for myself and about my skill sets and all the things that I had were within me. I didn't need anything else to do anything else. So it was a great way for me to end my career um, from that start. Do you all have another question or should I go to the audience? Good, you're good. Are you all right taking some questions? Mm -hmm. you have a few minutes? Um, Terrence, you have the mic, do you wanna just, oh, we got it. Yeah, there we go. I was just uh, curious, do you feel that the press treated you fairly throughout your career? And my name is Mason, by the way, I forgot to put that say in. Say what? My name is Mason, I forgot to Mason. say that at the beginning. <laughs> uh, hmm. You know, in a weird way, I mean, look, I signed two of the, I signed the two biggest contracts in, in Major League Baseball history. Um, and I was polarizing, and I came to New York, and uh, there was a shortstop already there, and then I moved to third base. So I think a lot of times the fans had to decide, you know, do I like our guy or do I like Darth Vader? Well, that was an easy decision for most. Um, <laughs> but what happened was I gave them too much, um, I, I put too much gasoline, and as a result, they used it against me. So I blame myself more than I blame them. You know, and the irony is, again, full circle, is when I returned after my suspension and I became, and I, I, I changed, I changed, and uh, they saw a different person, I put out a different energy, I was more respectful, I was more centered, and there was an appreciation about everything that I did. I thought, ever since I came back, the media's been incredible with me, and I'm, you know, knock on wood. So, it ultimately, you have to look in the mirror and be accountable, and uh, it's on you. See if we can get a mic over. No, I'm just going to go to um, this gentleman first, and then then we can go to you. <laughs> well, let, let me kind of give it let everybody know because uh, not everybody here is a Red Sox fan. So uh, Veritech and I got in a fight uh, in 2004 that was pretty legendary. And to me, uh, it was when baseball was really at its height. Um, every, we had a lot of interest. Uh, the New York Yankee Red Sox, you know, the rivalry was at its absolute pinnacle. Uh, both fan bases were completely engaged. And you had two teams that were really World Series ready. And we had superstars all over the place, maybe half a dozen in each. And then underneath that, we had a bunch of great players. And there wasn't a bad player on the field, two great managers. And the rivalry was really intense. And it started in the off season when literally it took me two months to negotiate a deal with John Henry and Theo and Jed. And we have a signed contract with John Henry, Alex Rodriguez, and Theo Epstein. Um, and anyways, something the union ended up canceling that deal, ended up with the Yankees. So I think that started the foreplay of the rivalry and the heat. And sure enough, you know, in, in the heat of the battle, um, I thought I didn't like what happened, and I kind of expressed myself in not such a nice way. And then he had something to say, and I said, well, if you have something to say, we can do something about it right now. In not such nice words. <laughs> and then we kind of threw down, and that's what happened. There you go. I'm going to go to the gentleman that, yep. Quick question. So yeah. a few years ago, J.R. Moringer wrote a story about you, and he didn't use a single, a single quote from you, and he made a point of that. Um, I found that very interesting, and I was just curious how he built your trust to allow, for you to allow him to write a story that you had no input on. Yeah, that is, uh, well, I did have input, okay. and so let me tell everyone what the story is about. So, uh, Right when I was done serving my suspension, uh, I had a gentleman by the name of J.R. Moringer, who's uh, a great, talented writer and a good, really good human being. And uh, he wanted to set a story. Did you read the story, Willow? So it's actually a really, really interesting story. Um, he wanted to set up a story, me walking into spring training. I think he wrote about ten or 11,000 words. And it was basically an A to Z, behind-the-scenes look at what happened during my suspension. 
and what are some of the things that I worked on? I think he started the article when I was actually in class with a hoodie on and uh, ended it by basically me walking into spring training. Um, the reason why he didn't quote me is because he thought I was so untrustworthy that I wasn't believable to quote me. So he thought that would be crap. So I said, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> so he then wrote a story, um, which was a great story and an accurate story, not all flattering, but fair, which is all you ask for is fair. Um, and I thought it was great. You know, a as a result, we've become uh, friends after that, and now he's not allowed to write about me because now we're friends. And uh, uh, I enjoy him a lot more as a friend than a writer, even though he's written some great books. <laughs> he also wrote the book of Agassiz, um, the Andre, I think it's called Open. Uh, he's a phenomenal writer. Yes, great. That was great. Bio. So you wrote um, recently an article that, that I read, uh, and you talked about the turnaround of the Chicago Cubs as a case study and how to bring a team or business back to life. Are you as comfortable um, writing as you are on the air? And will you continue to, first of all, will you continue, do you hope to continue in your career on the air? And will you continue churning out articles too? Yeah, so I, I'm probably not as comfortable writing. I'm not, a, I'm not a great writer, but I do have some really, um, I, I think, some deep thoughts about baseball and the way baseball, uh, what I've learned kind of in my 10,000 hours and my 25 years of being involved uh, in the game in the major league level. Um, and I thought, uh, by a show of hands, how many people wrote, read that article? Okay, great. So, um, <laughs> moving on to another question. No, so what I did is I wrote an article uh, pre-game one of the World Series, and uh, by watching the Cubs closely, the fact that they hadn't won in 108 years was a fascinating story. It was also bigger than a baseball story. It was an American uh, kind of romance story. And if you went around Wrigley Field in the city of Chicago, uh, it was pretty magical. I mean, it was 70 degrees every day and sunny, and you knew that the good Lord was kind of looking over Wrigley and kind of, you know, blessing baseball and blessing the Cubs. And I, I wanted to shed some light on the master, incredible job that Tom Ricketts, the owner, uh, bought the team for about $850 million in 2009. And then two years later, he hires Theo Epstein and gives him $18 million. And people said, oh, wow, that's way too much. And then Theo went on and uh, hired Joe Madden. And then Joe Madden and Theo went out and got John Lester. And what I went on to write was that uh, those four horsemen were the synopsis and the reason why they broke a 108-year curse. And then the three silos that I spoke about was the business development, the hotels, the way Wrigley Field was transforming with the real estate side and the business side. B, I talked about Theo and the player development on the field. And C, which I described as the hardest thing to do in businesses, is shift the culture. And sometimes it takes 50 or 70 years, and Theo Epstein was able to do it in five years. And I was just in awe and fascinated by this incredible business plan. And I was inspired to put it on paper. And uh, I was going to write in the New York Times and uh, Wall Street Journal. I didn't have enough space. So uh, Fox Sports was generous enough to give me space in, in their dot com. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to maybe go to you, the lady sitting back there with the cap on. Hi, um, my name is Chelsea. So I grew up in New York and watched the Yankees, and I remember when the news year suspension broke, and I feel like a, a lot of the fans felt like kind of a trade and hurt. So what was it like for you returning to the stadium after the, the suspension and like facing that, and what was it like trying to rebuild trust in the fans? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, was, um, it, was, it was an awful time, and it was uh, rock bottom for sure. You know, it's funny. Um, I was hoping that I got a 50-game suspension or 100, but it was 162. And it was a blessing in disguise because I needed the full year to rehab my life, my mind physically and emotionally. And I needed to turn the, the lens inward and look deep, deep inside to see what the heck was going on that I kept making so many mistakes. And if you think about guaranteed contracts, um, they're guaranteed. You can literally sit on the couch and get <laughs> fat and just collect a lot of money. And that even makes it even dumber, some of the decisions I made. And I would look up there and I would be... Uh, sleeping at night and I couldn't sleep it was four in the morning while I was serving my suspension literally tears would come off and I'm like I'm the only dummy that has pocket aces and figures out a way to lose this hand and it was really a depressing time for me and you know when I came out on the other side uh, and I talked to my daughters I told them about the mistake that I made 
Um, I wanted to be a different person. I wanted to be real. I wanted to be open. And uh, I wanted to be, have a humble approach and really value relationships at all levels. And I think because I, I, that's what I wanted to do and it, was, and it was real and it was genuine, I think people in New York and our fans are very, very smart. You can BS them. And I think they really sense a different guy. I didn't know if I was going to play well. I really didn't. But I was very fortunate that I was able to hit 33 home runs, help us get back in the postseason, and at the same time show that uh, I am a different person. And for all of that, I have Hal Steinbrenner to thank. Great. And I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna wrap because I promised you Great. an hour. Um, I'd like you all to join me in thanking Alex for sharing his wisdom with us today. O open invitation. Come back and join us. You could tape a podcast back there in the studio. You could anchor on the set one day. Right. You could take a class. You could teach a class. We'll have you back anytime. Thank you. So thank thank you. you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Yeah.